So we have Yuri Polyansky from MIT who works on the information theory and coding theory. And for a change, he'll give us a whiteboard talk. Yeah, actually, I never gave a slides talk at Simon's, so, uh, so I'm keeping with the tradition more than. Um, yeah, so this is a joint work with uh, a student of uh, mine and uh, Li Zhongzheng, Anurang Makur at MIT, and a professor at MIT, uh, Elkanan Mosel. Okay, so the, this is my only slide for today, Broadcasting on Bounded Degree Directed Acyclic Graphs. This is the title of the talk. Uh, my name is Yuri Polyansky, I'll give a talk. So, okay, so let me um, start with, uh, actually let me start with thanking organizers for inviting me to Simon. So I spent a fantastic one semester three years ago here in the program on information theory. And um, so if you're watching this online and planning to spend your sabbatical uh, in Simon's, I definitely recommend this. Okay, so, uh, so let me start with formulating the problem. Okay, so we will have one bit, x0, which is the only one half. Okay, so, and let me first draw things and then I'll explain what they mean. So we have a directed acyclic graph and uh, I will call uh, this horizontal uh, uh, stretch as layers. So the, the first layer consists of two random variables. The second layer maybe consists of uh, uh, so this is x21, x22, let's say 4. Uh, okay, so, so we'll get some kind of functions here. Actually, actually let's make this one like this. Okay, so x30, x31, x32, x33. All right, so, so what is happening here? Uh, so I'm drawing arrows, and each arrow represents a binary symmetric channel. Okay, so let me, let me zoom in here. Let's select some particular node, for example, this one, right? So let's zoom in. So what, what happens inside this, inside, the, inside this box? Okay, so... So what happens inside, uh, right, so let me put it like this. Uh, so I have x, i, j, and I have a bunch of arrows coming in, a bunch of arrows uh, coming out of it. And what I want, what this represents, is the following picture. So there is some function, f, i, j, which takes the prescribed inputs, the inputs coming from uh, the previous layer, and makes some computation, right, and produces some output. So, so this output is xij, and then this output gets broadcasted to some descendants. Okay, so, um, right, so what are these little pluses? So these little pluses uh, are addition of binary symmetry, of uh, binary uh, symmetric noise, meaning that if some number x, let's say lm, is connected on the other side of this edge, right, then what fij sees, so xij becomes fij of, of all the inputs, but the inputs get perturbed by the modulo, uh, by the modulo Bernoulli noise, right, so z is all, all these random variables appearing here in the noise. They are all IID and Bernoulli delta. Okay, so information theorists, of course, call such links uh, binary symmetric channels. Okay, so, all right, so we, and yeah, and so now the important pieces of notation, so D out is the out degree, out degree of, it, of, of a node, right, and D in is going to be in degree of an old. Okay, and now, so what fij is, so fij is just a Boolean function, right? 0, 1, d in, 2, 0, 1. Okay, so what is happening here? So, so a bit, 
appears at the root of the of this um, directed acyclic graph, right? And now the bit starts to traverse this network, and every time he traverses the channel, he might get flipped, right? And and these functions, which I call processing functions, or you can also call them relay functions, right? They look at the inputs and they try to maybe do something smart, right? And 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 so once, for example, this node sees the inputs, the noisy inputs coming from these two uh, other nodes, right? It tries to do something smart and and output, you know, some information uh, down down the stream, right? Okay. So so what's the goal? The goal is to co come up with. Uh, Come up. Oh yeah, and the sizes of the layers are going to be called LK. So L0 is 1, L1 is 3, and L2 is what? 3, 4, right? And so on. Okay, so now given the goal is the following. Goal is to try to reconstruct, right, to find the best estimator, maximum likelihood, I call it, right, of, uh, of the root bit. Right, so the goal of these guys, far away from, from the root, is to try to guess what's the value of the original bit, right? And so, of course, as we all know, the optimal estimator is to just uh, uh, right, to compute the conditional expectation or compute the conditional probability, right? So xk denotes, right? So, so xk denotes uh, the vector of all the, of all the uh, outputs at a given at a given layer. All right. So, okay. So, and, and we will say that, you know, so there is probability of error, right? P e star uh, from decoding at kth layer, right? This is just the probability of. Can you guys see down down here, or should I put it somewhere? Okay, I'll put it somewhere up. I, I wanted to use this for for uh, another. Okay, so, so let me just say, okay, goal. Find this as probability that the best possible decoder at kth layer. Right, this is probability of error, right? So, so we want to minimize this, right? And so we will we will say that if limit p e star comma k as k goes to infinity is less than one half, then we say broadcasting is possible. On this grid, casting. Okay, and the question is, for what grids? For what? So right. So there are two two design parameters here. One design parameter is the graph. The other design parameter is the processing functions, right? And the goal is to be able to come up with such such graphs and processing functions. That the recovery is possible with probability of error slightly better than half. Yes. IID globally. IID the noise is completely IID globally. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. So now, of course, the most important question that is in hopefully in most of your uh, heads now is who cares? Okay. So, so let me give you examples first. This is one of the problems which I call toy problems, meaning I don't, okay, this is recorded, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> it's an important problem, yes. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example. Uh, A trees, okay. So special case where the in degree of every node is one, right? So then we get a very simple picture, right? For example, we even consider a regular tree, right? So that to every guy. Okay. So, so this is a famous problem. So, uh, so what's the theorem here? Okay. So, uh, well, first of all, why why did people solve this? Okay. Uh, originally, people in seventies looked at this because this problem corresponds to uh, solving whether you can uh, learn the root bit from the output of the bottom corresponds to a studying properties of the Gibbs measure for the easing model on the tree and the extremality of a certain certain kind of Gibbs measure corresponding to free field to free boundary condition that's the reason people studied this so those folks uh, that work culminated with uh, uh, the following theorem 
Now, the, it's a little bit murky. You know, I never could understand what exactly the story is, but let me attribute it also to another, uh, another paper, <coughs> Evans Canyon uh, RS and Schulman. So this second paper references them and credits them, but uh, I think the, the life of this problem really started from this paper, so it became more, more popular. So okay, so what did they prove? They proved the following beautiful result. They said, all right, so if one minus two delta square, so let's, let's consider regular trees, right? Let's say regular DRE tree. So D out is equal to D. So actually, these papers are more general, but uh, let's consider this. OK, so if 1 minus 2 delta square d is strictly uh, greater than 1, then broadcasting is possible. So if 1 minus 2 delta square d is, is less than or equal to 1, then impossible. OK, very nice characterization. I'll talk about it in a second. OK, and uh, um, now this problem originally, as I said, was coming from statistical physics, right? And it became more popular. Oh, sorry, 1 minus 2 delta squared, right? So it's exact characterization. So covers all cases. OK, so why it became more popular? For two reasons. First of all, there is some connection to reconstruction of phylogenetic trees, where these are mutations. And the second, uh, more modern reason, is that actually this problem appears in uh, random constraint satisfaction problems, for example, in community detection, on, uh, because on random sparse graph, right, random bounded degree graph is locally tree-like. So when you do some kind of reconstruction, you are, you are looking at a situation like this locally. OK, so, um, so for this reason, yeah, this became a very famous, in particular, as I said, threshold for community detection was settled by uh, application of this theorem. OK, so this is one motivation. So my motivation came actually from another, uh, from another angle, which is the following. So let's consider another example of graphs, which is regular grids. So for example, this is a regular two-dimensional grid. So basic problem that, uh, that, that I'm interested in general in my sort of uh, uh, research life is how information spreads in networks and when can it spread and when it cannot. Like, for example, let's consider some spatial network, even as regular as a two dimensional grid, right? And suppose there is some information, you know, entering in the center at time zero, right? And then, so every time, you know, maybe there is some algorithm, some gossip, I don't know, uh, whatever. Uh, what's the other? I forgot the name. So anyways, undistributed algorithm running here. Consensus, that's right. Thank you, Venka. <laughs> yes. So some distributed algorithm running, right? So the, the people are doing different things. But the interesting thing is to bound sort of, uh, right? So how much after d iteration, after k iterations, let's say, right? Of that. So in the first iteration, information flows through, through noisy links to this neighborhood, right? So then we get, so this is my layer. So this was my layer 0. My layer 1 is this one, right? So then at the second iteration, right, my, my information will flow here. Right, so, so this is going to be. And of course, I mean, the functions that, that, that these guys apply right, may not be for, for broadcasting. But I'm asking, uh, right, I'm, I'm overbounding. I'm asking the question, so in a, in a given system with a given noise level, Right? When something happens, and I give you values of everything on a faraway boundary, is all information lost or not? Right? So there is this wave of information spreading from the center about this, this influence at time zero. Right? And the question is, does this wave, does the front of this wave contain any knowledge about the root? Right? OK, so, so this is the main question that motivated uh, me a few years ago. So Here you have in degree two and some nodes, right? So what function do you want to use? Yeah, well, OK, so we'll talk about this. Yeah, so, so here's, the, here's the informal question, right? So is it possible, is it possible to find FIJs such that broadcasting is possible on this broadcasting? 
multitasking is possible. OK, so since I'm probably not going to have time to go, let me, not, uh, let me just tell you, no, it's not the answer, sorry. It's the main conjecture. And it's a, it's a strange form of conjecture. It's a conjecture cons cons consisting of two parts. OK, so here's the main conjecture. In 2D, <coughs> two-dimensional grids, no. In 3D, yes. So when I say no, I mean that for every positive noise, no matter how small, there is no way you can come up with the arrangement of functions, right? Such that you can reconstruct you can reconstruct the original root bit from from the knowledge of the boundary, and in 3D maybe yes. I mean that's the conjecture, and again I mean I wouldn't put money like uh, some of my colleagues like to do on this because you know the more I work on this the more 50/50 each line here becomes. So. Uh, but okay, but let me right. So let me tell you first. Okay, so so I don't have an answer to this, only partial answer. If I have time, I'll tell you what we can prove. So, uh, but for now, let's ask a, a simpler question, right? So when I when I talked about this to Elkanan, so he immediately said, "Oh, Yuri, so there is one fundamental difference in this grid compared to the tree grid." Okay, the first difference is of course that because in degree is not one, now there is a design question, right? What should be the relay functions? Right? But the second important difference is the following. So, so you see, this, this uh, characterization has a beautiful uh, intuition behind it. So here's the intuition. Uh, information theorists know that in a certain uh, precise sense, when uh, information passes through a binary symmetric channel, it gets lost by a coefficient 1 minus 2 delta square. Right? So, so across each edge, Right? So if information starts here, then only 1 minus 2 delta square of information jumps out of, of the output. Right? OK, and so you can see that the DRE tree right, replicates this information d times. So on one hand, you have 1 minus 2 delta square loss. Right? On the other hand, you have a replication factor. Right? So if the replication factor beats the loss, right? so then on average, you're not losing. Right? And, if it's, and if it's not sufficient, OK, so this analogy maybe cannot explain the equality case here, but uh, for strict inequality, right, it's sort of, it's very natural. And actually, this uh, intuitive understanding is not completely useless because you can convert it into an exact proof using, using this, as I said, I mean, uh, the, the tools from information theory in particular. OK, so, right, but the important thing from this intuition is that to overcome this noise, right, you have to do some replication. And if you have to do some replication, then you see, so the growth of layers here is what? It's d to the k. It's exponential, right? So if you set d equals to 1, then OK, you don't get any reconstruction. Actually, this, this, uh, th this theorem also holds for something called Galton-Watson tree, in which degree is not an integer. So then it's an average. And then it still holds. So then you can see from that that only with, you, can, you get reconstruction only from exponential uh, expon only for trees with exponentially growing uh, layers. OK, so, so then the, the basic question, right, which this is the easy question. So all the stuff about the regular grid, as usual, is super tough. It's, you know, it's, it's very particular. But the stuff that I can actually talk about in, in limited time is, uh, is, is about the following question. Right? So question is exponential, is exponential growth LK is necessary for broadcasting. <coughs> or let me phrase it in an equivalent way. Or can FIJs fuse information, right? Can they do information fusion? us to save space. So we are adding a degree of freedom. We are subtracting a degree of freedom, right? The question is, OK, so. so. The question here would be whether the transient recurrence uh, dichotomy is what controls it. I mean, you're, you're trying to embed, I guess, the tree inside the graph. Yeah, Venkat, we, we try to think about it. Yeah, so Venkat is saying that the interesting uh, difference between 2D and 3D is the behavior of random walk, right? It's transient versus uh, recurrent. 
in, in two and three dimensions. Uh, maybe that's the right analogy. As I said, I mean, my analogy, if I get to that, is more from the cellular automata story. If you, if you know that there is, right, there are non ergodic two dimensional cellular automata, but there are no one dimensional non ergodic cellular automata. So, yeah, tombs, exactly. But uh, the updates of cellular automata happen in parallel. How does this? Yes, because you, when you transform from layer to layer, this is a synchronous update. OK, but uh, we're going ahead. So OK, so the answer to this question is yes. right? But before answering it, I, I wanted to give at least some kind of proof. So what? I'm about 15 minutes? OK, good. So OK, so the answer is yes. And OK, so before we start there, let, let's, let's ask the following question. So actually, how small, how small LK can be? Okay, so let's prove the following proposition. If, if okay, so, right. And uh, yeah, the, yeah, let's say, so for, 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 for reasons of, again, of analogy with, with the, of the regular grids, right? Let's bound the in degree, right? So for any DAG, for any DAG with D in less than or equal to D, uh, right? And LK less than, okay, some constant, which only depends on delta and D, log K. Right? If, if, if layers grow logarithmically, fast or slower than a certain logarithm, right, then reconstruction is impossible. Uh, broadcasting, sorry. Then broadcasting, broadcasting is impossible. OK, so how do you prove this? It's a very easy proof. So might as well do it. OK. so. Um, so you see, so the first thing, the first step is something. That, so if you are an information theorist, you might not know it, but this is mostly a, a probability uh, uh, question. So for prob for probabilists, that's natural, but for information theorists, it might be less natural. So here's a funny way to represent binary symmetric channel, right? So so let's suppose you have binary symmetric channel with crossover probability delta, right? X enters, Y pops out. We know that Y is just a flip of X with probability delta, right? So what smart can I say here? Well, here's one way to think about this. You say that, well, Y is actually equal to X with probability 1 minus 2 delta. And it's equal to independent Bernoulli half random variable with probability 2 delta. So it's a, so it's a funny way to think binary symmetric channels as opposed to doing flips. It, it does copy versus destruction of information, right? And this, so you can check that this exactly defines the, our beloved binary symmetric channel. Um, right, so now here's what you can do. You can take a look at this graph, right, that I drew here. And you can say, OK, so somebody gave me a graph, right? So let me pre-generate these decisions, right? So these decisions, whether I'm destroying information or not, right? So I, I'm given a graph. So essentially, I need to generate this noise ID. But let me first pre-generate these decisions. And let me uh, show which edges uh, act by this uh, destruction, right, by, by crosses, right? Like, for example, right? So you generate a random ID to delta process, right? And, and these are, you know, this is the, these are the links that you destroyed, right? OK, so now, so it's easy to see that OK, conditioned on the event, right? So suppose that, uh, actually, OK, so let me write it rigorously. So let E, let E be event that crosses, that crosses, uh, Disconnect, disconnect root x0 from infinity. From infinity. Right? OK, so then on this event, right, x0 is independent, is, is independent of x, 
right, of, let's say, okay, of, of x infinity, right, of the infinite layer, right, of x far away, or, le or more rigorous, I mean, you can put it approximately independent, right, for all k greater than k0, okay, maybe it's random, right, uh, given a e, right. So if the sequence of destructions is so dense that it disconnects every single path of root to the bottom, right, and there is no way information about x0 can trickle to, to, the, to, to, to the far away layer, right, okay, so then, then what you can do is you can just say, well, okay, so what's the, pro right, so if I have bounded degree d uh, layer, right, so what's the probability that all edges are erased here, right, it's at most, right, so, so with probability, with probability greater than 2 delta times uh, LKD, right, all edges will be erased, right, so now what you can do is you can just say, okay, um, where should I put it, let me put it here. <laughs> don't, don't tell me this was not copied. <laughs> okay, so this was the action of the erasure channel. <laughs> Sorry. I thought this was from some, far, from some long forgotten program. No, it's for our long, least remote viewers to know where to send questions. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay. So for the next talk, we need to put it back. Okay, I'll, I'll put it back, yeah. All right, so anyway, so right, so now if, right, so if sum of two delta times LKD is infinite, right, then by Borel Cantelli, by Borel Cantelli, probability of the event E is one, right? Where E is the event that you disconnected everything, right? So this immediately tells you that if layers grow, you know, with, with size logarithmic, then, you know, with probability one, you will kill all the edges at some point, okay? So, so what can we, what can we say on the positive side? Okay, so on the positive side, we can actually see, say that this is tight. But indeed, for any super, for any logarithmic growth with large enough constant, there exists a, a so called random lag majority. Okay, so, right, so theorem is the following. For any d, actually, let me not say for any d, let's just say for d in equals three. I, I want to discuss the case of, uh, of input of uh, in degree three. Uh, the following is true. First, if lk is greater than c1 delta comma, well, C1 delta times log k and delta, the crossover probability is between zero and one sixth. Then, okay, so then let, let, me, let me say what happens then. Expectation over graph, probability E star uh, comma k Right, so limit as k goes to infinity is less than one half. Okay, so what is expectation over g? I will explain it in a second. Now, conversely, if lk is sub-exponential, e to the e1 of delta times k, and delta is between one-sixth and one-half, um, then expectation of g of p e star comma k converges to one half. Okay, so, so what is g? So our g, right, so g is a random DAG process. It's a random DAG. Okay, so how do we generate it? So, okay, so notice that so we fix the sequence of layer sizes. Right, so you fix the sequence of layer sizes, you tell me how fast you want your layers to grow, and, and then I will generate the graph as follows. So, so I put this, these nodes, right, of whose number you already prescribed to me, 
right? And then I will add, I will randomly draw three of these edges because my in degree is three, right? And connect them randomly to to, to different folks upstairs, right? Just completely at random. Okay. So this is my right. So this generates a random graph, and what I'm saying is that ah yeah, and of course I need to tell you what the processing functions are, right? So all the processing functions are just majority. So right. So all fijs are just majority. Okay, so, um, all right, so how do you prove this? Okay, so this is not very hard. Again, I can, I can just tell you one, one interesting trick how to do it, and that's it. Right, so, oh, by the way, so we originally thought of this construction random DAG as just for answering the question about the speed of growth of layer sizes. But then actually, so uh, people started pointing out that maybe this is actually relevant by itself, and perhaps even more relevant by itself than the regular grid. Why? Because this can tell you about, you know, spreading of information in complicated uh, grids, right? Something like, you know, a graph, like Facebook graph, I don't know, something, right? So which, which, which doesn't look like, a, you know, uh, like two or three dimensional regular grid. Okay, so, uh, all right, so how do you prove this? Okay, so the proof is actually very, very easy. Why? Because you can check that if you define sigma k minus one to be fraction of ones at layer uh, k minus one. Okay, so then, now I'm thinking about joint randomness, right? So I have two sources of randomness. One source of randomness is uh, uh, I fix x0, right, to be, for example, 0, right, and one randomness is the noise, and the other randomness is generating of the graph, right? So I condition on everything uh, above a certain level, above k minus 1, right? So then the interesting thing is that x, k, comma, i, all of these guys are distributed according Bernoulli, conditioned on, on everything up until layer k minus 1. So these guys are uh, Bernoulli, iid, g delta, sigma k minus 1. Okay, so what is g delta? So g delta sub p is a very nice function. It's a, it's a probability that majority of x1 plus z1, x2 plus z2, x3 plus z3 is equal to 1, where zi's are iid Bernoulli delta. Oh, this is mod 2, right? Bernoulli delta and Xi's are IID Bernoulli P. Okay. And in particular, right, so because this XKI, so why are they random, why are they IID and independent? Because, right, this, this process of generating edges is independent between, right, so that's, that's why the random graphs are so easy to analyze, right, because they completely de decouple uh, the dynamics of two adjacent sites. And that's exactly why it's so hard to analyze the grid, right, because this doesn't happen. Okay, so, um, right, and because they are IID, and there are lots of them, right, the, the average magnetization at the, kth layer, at the kth layer, right, by law of large numbers, is approximately equal with high probability this G delta of sigma k minus 1. So essentially, the average magnetization is a non-random, has a non-random evolution, right, corresponding to this iterative application of, of this function G. So now the only question is, how does G look like, right? So we have these iterations. Right, okay, so, so it turns out to look like this. So if delta is less than one sixth, then, okay, so this is my zero, one, zero, one. Okay, so it looks like this. It's, it's symmetric around, so it has a center of symmetry at, at point half, half. Right and, and otherwise, so you can see that for delta less than one sixth, it has three fixed points. So if you start, if, if your initial bit is zero, right? So you start here, and then you you slowly grow up, right? So let, let's say, right? So you, you, let's let's bend it a little bit. It's actually convex concave, but okay, right? So you start from zero, and then you do this kind of progression of these iterations, right? And you always grow up to to this fixed point. And at, if you start at one, then you then you do these iterations, right? And you come to this fixed point. So because of this, you never. Uh, 
So if, if the original bit was zero, then average magnetization is great. It's, it's, it's around this value. And uh, if you start from one, uh, sorry, if you're some, you understand what I said, right? So the average magnetization completely uh, tells you yes, it tells you the answer. And on the other hand, for delta greater than one six, right? So if delta is greater than one six, then this g del this g of p function has only one fixed point. It looks like this. Right. And for this reason, so zeros and ones become merged. Okay. The axes are not really IID, right? They're exchangeable, I guess, right? No, they are exactly IID. At any given level, because you're oh, yeah, I forgot to say that we actually allow double edges. Oh. Yeah, so, so it's completely fine if sometimes you have, right, so this. Yeah, I thought you had to find yeah no, yeah, then, then it would be a little bit messier. But, other, but like this. Yeah, yeah. Same as the bootstrap percolation? Bootstrap I don't know what a bootstrap percolation is. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, 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 that's exactly, yes, yes, right. Right, it's a boot, right, right. Yes, that's, a, that's this kind of percolation on a random graph. Yeah, so it's very easy to analyze. So I guess the two thresholds you're analyzing is the threshold of just the edge percolation versus the bootstrap percolation. This would be the. Yes. OK, so uh, yes, but for converse, you can be smarter. Yes, so. I guess my next question would be, is the bootstrap population itself a converse? So is it if and only if this population? No, this we don't know. OK, so this is a good question. So uh, yeah, so you see, so the way I put it here, right? So. Uh, as you said, so the bootstrap percolation, the threshold is very easy to analyze right here. So that's, but the thing is, maybe, right, if so the actual, so let, let me finish by saying one open question, right? So, okay, so this kind of settles everything uh, in this random. So there are two open questions. One is de-randomize the construction, right? To come up with some weaker condition, like is some kind of expansion sufficient to just prove this? And the second more important question is the following. So you see, so you can use some general information theory tricks to show that uh, for if one minus two delta squared times d is less than 1, then no matter how you pick those smart functions, you will always die out. So this is, right, so this is for, every choice of, for every choice of Fij's, which can depend on the graph, right? You first generate a graph, and then you scratch your head, you look at this, right? You do that. So OK, and this gives you the threshold delta, which is 0.21 or something like this, right? And this is 0.17, right? So between 0.17 and 0.21, we don't know if there exists. So, for, so that's, but there is hope because, uh, yeah, I forgot to say that this exact iteration appears in von Neumann uh, reliable circuit stuff. And, and there, actually, Hayek and Weller showed that 1 6 is a sharp threshold. But we have some, dif some, some, some uh, differences here. OK, anyway, so as I expected, I don't have time to say anything about regular grids. But what we proved is we proved that AND, NAND, and XOR processing doesn't work. <laughs> That's the summary. But it doesn't invalidate uh, the, 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 the chance that, right, so that maybe there is a smart uh, space-dependent choice of processing functions which will work. So this I don't know. Yeah, all right, so thank you.